بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ومن صار على نهجهم إلى يوم الدين Oh praise belongs to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my dear brothers and sisters and viewers at home I ask Allah tabaraka ta'ala who the one who chose to bless these particular days that you are chosen from those who are blessed on these blessed days of Dhul Hijjah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of your deeds that you have offered and I ask Allah Jalla wa ala to allow you to continue to exert yourselves and benefit from these particular days which are the very best days of the entire year and I'm sure that this has been uh, said to you on more than one occasion before the uh, coming of this particular uh, season and maybe continue to be said to you. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all and accept from you all and allow us to be from those who are the fa'izin, from those who are the winners, the successful ones during these uh, particular days. Now, if you didn't already know, uh, we have entered into the uh, days of Dhul Hijjah. And now, uh, at the end of this week, uh, Friday, will be the day of Arafah and Saturday will be the day of Eid so therefore now uh, if my maths is correct we're on the 5th the of Dhul Hijjah 6, 7, 8, 9 yeah something like this so we're halfway through almost subhanallah uh, the days of, of Dhul Hijjah and they are Afdalu Ayam al Dunya as the Prophet alayhi salatu salam he said in a sound hadith that these are the best 10 days in this world. The best 10 days in this world. And it's important for us to make the most of that. If I was, I didn't really fully acknowledge or was, or was even aware about the blessings of these particular days. Uh, there's, you shouldn't be in a state of loss. There are many days, or I say many, we should see it as mashallah, great opportunities in front of us. Okay, to, to do a lot of good things inshallah ta'ala. Um, to arrange your qurbani, your udhiya. If that's not done locally, you can't do that yourself, then you arrange with a trustworthy charity or person to do that abroad for you. That can be done, inshallah ta'ala. And for the individual who's arranging that, then they refrain from uh, trimming their nails and cutting their hair. Okay, And one sheep or one share in a camel or one share in a cow, that would be sufficient for a household. Okay, That would be sufficient. So if the father or the husband, if you like, organizes that for his uh, the members of his family, he is the one who refrains, everybody else does not have to refrain because he is the one who is arranging that and this is the practice of the Prophet والسلام, and as in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqama bil madinati ashra that he alayhi wa sallam stayed in Medina for 10 years and on each of those years he ensured that he alayhi wa sallam that he would offer a qurbani an udhiya at the time of Eid so it's a very important sunnah brothers and sisters for us to uh, keep alive and that there's lots of khair there's lots of khair in that inshallah ta'ala uh, in uh, if you keep some of the meat for yourself you give some away as a gift and you can give some away as a sadaqa as well if you have uh, it with you if you don't have that with you then your intention is maybe just to give it out as a sadaqa and that's fine inshallah ta'ala but the most important thing is to fulfill uh, the obligation upon the view that it's an obligation, which is a very strong view. Uh, this is the Islamica show, brothers and sisters, where the number at the bottom of your screen is, is, is appearing in Sha'ala Ta'ala, and you have the opportunity to call in uh, to put your question to us uh, by the telephone number, and also the option of the WhatsApp. Uh, you can put your questions through the WhatsApp in Sha'ala Ta'ala, and we'll try our best uh, to get through as many questions as we can, but it's nearly Ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, this is a very... Uh, important show for us all and alhamdulillah it, it is a broadcast twice a day at 12 o'clock and also in the evening something around 8 o'clock in the evening so mashallah uh, the Islam channel puts a lot of uh, great deal of effort to ensure that these avenues are there for you Muslims uh, 
to ask your questions, to remove the uh, matters which you're ignorant of or that you don't know of and things like that. Nobody's expected to know everything. Don't make things up as you go along. If you're able to ask somebody, then go ahead and do that, inshallah ta'ala. Just as Allah ta'ala has told us in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So, without any further delay, alhamdulillah, we have a caller on the line. So we'll take that caller now, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Your question, please. Um, my brother passed away on Thursday, and he was a non-Muslim. Am I able to attend his funeral? So you have a, a non-Muslim family friend? You uh, no, no. I, I'm a reaver. Okay. And my brother passed away on Thursday. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, sister. Okay. Am I able to attend his funeral? Okay, okay. Um, okay, I'll answer the question. May Allah make it easy for you, sister. Barakallah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so the sisters uh, asked. Um, her brother passed away. And uh, he wasn't a Muslim. Uh, is it allowed for us as Muslims to attend a uh, funeral? Um, <clears throat> this is one of the challenges. And it's a challenge because, you know, as Muslims, we have uh, maybe certain or different ways that we'll interact with uh, certain situations. And one of those is a funeral. And we have non-Muslim family members. Um, so first and foremost, uh, may Allah Azza wa Jal give you patience, sister. Um, my condolences to you and your family. Now, answering the question, um, if the funeral service itself is kind of a religious service, then we would refrain from uh, attending the funeral service. Because uh, as Muslims, we don't participate, we wouldn't be permitted to participate in, in a kind of a religious or semi religious kind of um, gathering. But you sending your condolences. And being there for your family, somebody as, as close as, as you know, like your brother, subhanAllah. Uh, being there with, you know, your mother and your father throughout these days, up until uh, maybe before uh, the funeral. Uh, it's important for you to be there with them and support them, inshallah, and send your condolences to them. Uh, especially when there is, um, you know, somebody passing in the family who is so close. And your siblings aren't. You know, there's nobody closer to you than your siblings, you know, subhanAllah. So you being there and supporting, and that, that's very important. But as for the actual uh, attending of the, um, the religious service, that's something that you would uh, explain to them in the very best way. I know it can be difficult explaining it to them. But your presence there before and all up, up until that should show that um, as a Muslim we must you know, show respect and, 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 you know, our love to our family members. But the fact is, if it's a religious element to that, that's, that's uh, something that you will take a pass on and then and afterwards you'll, you'll, you'll be there for them, okay? So I hope that they, that they will understand that. Um, because of the, uh, the position we have as Muslims, the religious uh, gatherings or religious services other than that what was taught to us, you know, in, in the teachings of Islam, you know, we're not permitted to, to participate in that. This isn't you disrespecting anyone. This isn't anyone, this isn't you, um, you know, not showing any kind of mercy to anyone. You know, but if you try to explain that in the best way, I hope that the, they are understanding of that. And I understand it's a very difficult time. And, you know, even in the scenario that there may be kind of an adverse reaction to you, just to be patient with them. Um, because I'm sure that is a very difficult time for them all. May Allah make it easy for you, sister. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to be uh, a good example of what it is, or of who a Muslim is, <clears throat> and that they see the beautiful side of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide your family. I mean. <clears throat> okay, we have some more questions, inshallah ta'ala. Um, mashallah, quite a few questions actually. Uh, firstly, do angels enter homes with pictures? Do and, uh, the hadith of Abu Talha radiallahu anhu is hadith al-Bukhari al-Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa said that the angels do not enter the homes in which pictures are hung up. Okay, So as Muslims we do not hang up pictures. Uh, when we say pictures, we mean pictures that have uh, 
uh, of, of the creation which has souls, like people or animals and things like that. So things like photographs and things like that, we should refrain from hanging up. I understand that people keep photographs on their phones and things like that, um, which, okay, which is, is, is acceptable, but to hang them up is, is something else, okay? So there are guidelines concerning taking pictures and whatnot, uh, but we should not hang up the pictures in the home. Okay, this is not permitted, and Allah Jalla knows best. How many marriage meetings are appropriate? Should there be a limit? Well, Islam did not uh, restrict numbers of meetings. Okay, uh, this really goes back to the individuals. Um, you know, sometimes I've I've come across you know both and both ends of the strip spectrum where they they've had no meetings, never even met, which is an issue because you don't know who you're marrying. Okay, and then on the other hand, you get people. Oh, we've been we've been having meetings for two years. You know, if you if you're having meetings for two years and you still don't know, then it's likely you will never know. Okay, so it's probably best to pass on that and go, go ahead and find somebody else. So with regards to meetings, you have to understand the purpose of you know, a, a meeting when people are interested in getting married. Uh, because people have this uh, understanding that, oh, I need to get know their whole personality before I marry them. You know, people living, after, living with each other after five years at times are still getting to know each other, okay? There are still asp at times aspects of a person's personality which can be I'm not saying that they're hiding it, but it, it just hasn't appeared for whatever reason. So you're not going to know absolutely everything about them. So the purpose of the meeting is what? Is for you to, because you have certain objectives you want to achieve in your life, okay, as a Muslim or a Muslimah, okay, family life, work life, home life, things like this, okay. Does this person see life like you? They, want to, they have similar objectives. So you get to see them, okay, they're pleasing to you, how you look, are they, you know, you're attracted to them, that's number one. Secondly, to discuss... Uh, you know, objectives in your life, what you want to achieve, what you want to do, what is acceptable for you in your life, okay? Uh, these are the things, really, main things are to be discussed. As things like, oh, you know, do you like sugar in your tea? Uh, oh, no, you know, um, what time do you like to have your dinner? You know, these things aren't the most important things. I'm not, I mean, you could go on forever having meetings, talking about these things which really are not going to have an impact on your life. You know, what's your favourite colour, you know? So in terms of the number of, time, number of times that you're going to meet, if you're asking me, I mean, two or three meetings, maximum is enough. You know. Each meeting in terms of time, Allah, maybe an hour, something like this, if that. You can make a decision on the person, put your trust in Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal, pray istikhara, and go with that. Okay? But it's not a restriction. It's not a restriction. You're going to do a bit more, okay, fine. You decide after one meeting, I've met my, uh, is my, my soulmate. You both agree on that. May Allah subhanahu wa bless you both. Now, okay. Uh, next question, what are the conditions of the udhiyah? Well, if you're talking about the animal, there are certain conditions which are pertaining to the animal. Uh, you know, things like, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the sound hadith, that there are four things which the animal should be free from. So it should not, you know, have uh, any defects in the animal. So it's not... Um, Limping, an apparent limping, you know, so it's kind of a, uh, walking, you know, inappropriately. It's, it shows it has a weakness, or there's something, it has one eye, or that it is overly skinny, okay, has no meat on it. These animals you should, you should refrain from. So a sheep should be at least six months old, a goat should be at least a year old, uh, a cow should be at least two years old, a camel should be at least five years old for it to qualify to be. Uh, to be sacrificed. Okay, so these are some of the conditions concerning the animal that's, that's sacrificed itself. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's what, if that's what you're referring to and you're going to do it yourself, you should bear this in mind. When can you cut your nails in Dhul Hijjah? Right, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, that if you are the one who's paying for, okay, and having the Qurbani arranged, you are the one who refrains from trimming nails and cutting hair. Okay, not your family members, not wife and children, because you're doing it on behalf of your household. Once the uh, Qurbani has been done, is complete, then you can trim and cut your nails, inshallah ta'ala. 
uh, as a question is linked to this, if I have paid someone else to do my udhiyah, can I cut my hair? It doesn't matter if you have paid and somebody else is going to do it on your behalf. Uh, you are still subject to not cutting your nails or your hair because you're the one arranging. You're paying for it. Okay, so you should refrain from that. And Allah subhanahu wa taala is best. Some people say that before going to sleep or before having surgery, one should recite the kalima. Because if the individual passes away, the last words were, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Is this act permissible to do so? Okay, we will answer this question. However, we have a call on the line. We'll take them first because we prioritize the calls. So we'll take that uh, call on the line, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, perfect. Okay, Sheikh. So I've been um, discussing some conversations with some uh, local Christians in my area. Uh -huh. And they, okay, so we are at the moment discussing about the Isra wal Iraj, you know, the, the journey to the heavens. Hey, what? Now, what, what they're telling me is that in Surah so Isra, in verse number 59, you know, Allah says that He has not sent any miracles to the prophets except that they had already been denied by the people of the past. Um, so what these uh, Christians said to me is that this verse here proves that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has not received any miracles from Allah and the, the whole journey to the sky was just a dream. Okay. Um, could I have your thoughts on that? And then they also referenced uh, Surah Isra verse number 90 as well uh, as proof that Muhammad didn't fulfill uh, the Christian's criteria. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jade. Okay, so here we have, uh, for all intents and purposes, a non-Muslim, it could be anyone, a non-Muslim saying and stating why this is why I'm not a Muslim. Okay, that's fine. Okay, if you say that you're not a Muslim because of this, I'm sure it's a number of reasons. I think, first and foremost, because when we get into the details of answering finer aspects of the Qur'an or finer aspects of, of the sunnah and things like that uh, because it's good to have conversations with um, people of the book people who are interested in, in searching for the truth talab uh, al-haq or the request or the requ or seeking the truth is an absolute must for every human being inshallah ta'ala but when a person is going on a journey of conversations and we're specifically talking about al-isra or wal miraj and that the Quran says this and th listen the Qur'an, alhamdulillah, the fadlillahi ta'ala, has stood up. First and foremost, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? There are no mistakes. There are no contradictions. Okay? Uh, you may say, oh, this is the Muslim point of view. Yeah, of course it is. What else? If we, we know the truth, alhamdulillah, we want to teach the truth. If somebody denies that, it's not because the isra wal mi'raj that you deny Islam or you deny the Qur'an. There are other things. I would always suggest that when discussing issues with people of the book, maybe special reference to Christians and whatnot, is to start from the very assess, from the foundation of belief, okay? And that is understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Understanding Allah jalla wa'ala. And that everything that comes after that, okay, will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So we can discuss uh, whether the, they believe in the mi'raj or not, whether, you know, uh, the miracles that came to the Prophet والسلام, whether it was the splitting of the moon, whether it was the Qur'an itself is a miracle, okay? This is, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, uh, the Isra and the Mi'raj, of course, is a miracle that the people of the Quraysh, they denied it, okay? But nonetheless, you know, the, Qur uh, the Quraysh denied it and you denied it. But alhamdulillah, many of the Quraysh, after a time, they believed because they recognized that the Qur'an is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Prophet ﷺ, with the Quran discussed with them the, the reality of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And a lot of the time, a lot of the time, you find when a person is a person who believes, for example, that the Quran is, is has been uh, distorted or it has been changed and things. If I can we can discuss these issues. If that person believes God died, okay, if that person believes God died. Okay. That's a far more important issue okay, to discuss than me talking about issues in the Qur'an.
concerning, well, you know, this is not a fulfillment of uh, a certain prophecy. This is not a fulfillment of, come on. If you believe that God died, this is a far more important issue for us to discuss. I understand that it's easy for me uh, to just refer you back to understanding and talking about, you know, the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may have had many discussions and many, uh, I, can, I think maybe you've called before actually, talking about questions with uh, the people of the book, Allah knows best. Uh, I think it was to do with, uh, if I remember, uh, Maryam alayhi salam and Harun, ya ukhta Harun, some verses from Surah Maryam. If it wasn't you, there's somebody who's having similar discussions with uh, people from, you know, uh, individuals following other scripture and whatnot. They didn't understand this, they didn't understand that. Uh, they're not acceptance of that because they don't understand it. Okay, no problem. We can go back to what is more important than that, and that is to understand the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And we have to remove the, the issue to believe that God died or the believe that God became part of his creation. These things, you need to untie these knots. So then after that, if they truly understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you give the message, okay, the true message to them, that is easy for them to digest. Okay? I would give this as a general advice, to be honest with you, to all those who are discussing with um, Christians, for example, as an example, just to start from the very foundations. If the foundations are not sound, then, you know, uh, everything that comes after that really is just to and froing. Allah knows best. Okay. So, going before, uh, we had a question that some people say, some people say, okay, this is a very, rawahu, uh, some people say, you know, narrated by some people said, if only they said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, okay, it would be of course much, much better. So some people say that going, before going to sleep, you should recite the kalima. Well, the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam taught us many things that we should say before we sleep, okay, from them, the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam used to recite Surah Al-Mulk, he used to recite Alaihi Wasallam, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Qul a'udhu barab al-falaq, Qul a'udhu barab al-nas, he used to recite Ayat al-Kursi. And if we recite Ayat al-Kursi, which contains the kalima, Allahu la ilaha illahu, al-hayyu al-qayyum. Allahu la ilaha illahu, al-hayyu al-qayyum. This contains the kalima. So, is it permissible to say the shahada? Of course, to say the shahada at, at any time, okay, is something which is, is good to do, a reaffirmation of your uh, of your faith, uh, but to leave what the Prophet ﷺ taught us, then you know, don't do that. Okay, so, <clears throat> and you know, remember that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Man kana akhar kalamahu la ilaha illallah dakhal al jannah." That whoever, whoever's last speech is la ilaha illallah will enter the paradise. It's a sound hadith. But is it just merely lip service, or is it that the person says "mukhlisan min qalbihi"? That the person says it sincerely from their heart. That is absolutely essential for it to have any value to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be from those whose last speech is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Allahumma ameen. Okay. What should I teach my children first? Quran, Iman, or prayer? You know, when we're teaching our children, it is not as though that we are teaching our children things exclusively. So if I teach my children Qur'an, I'm not teaching them Iman. Or I'm not teaching them Salah. Why don't you, for example, I'm going to teach my children prayer. And in the prayer, you're learning Qur'an. And in the prayer, you're learning, they're learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is part of our Iman. So you're kind of uh, putting them all together and achieving all three goals. Okay, so I'm sure that uh, we can achieve all three, inshallah ta'ala, one time. It's not you have to choose one and leave the other. Naam. What is the meaning of the name of Allah, Jalla wa'ala, Razzaq? Razzaq is the one who is the provider, the all provider. This is one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. Okay, brothers and sisters, we've come to the end of this first part of Islamic. Please join us on the other side of the adverse. Jazakum ala khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم 
بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back brothers and sisters to the second part of Islamica where mashallah we've been taking your questions most of them through uh, the whatsapp and we had a couple of callers we also have another caller on the line which we'll take now inshallah ta'ala Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah Yes a question please um, I wanted to ask um, I'm a Rebet sister, and my parents and my family are non-Muslim. If I do not persistently contact my sisters who have cut the full contact for the last 10 years, am I in any sin? I do keep contact with my parents and one of my sisters, yeah. but the other two have made it clear they don't want anything to do with me. Because you're a Muslim? So I just... Is that because you're a Muslim, or...? Yeah. Okay. Okay, inshallah. I'll try to answer. Well, yeah. Well, I'll make it easy for you, sister. Um, okay. So, Ariva, a sister. Um, so, some of her sisters who have decided to cut their relationship with her. She said it's been, for, been, been out for about 10 years. So, I assume she's been a Muslim for a number of years now. So... Uh, keeping relationships uh, as a revert, somebody embraced Islam. Now, w the reality is that m many people, most people, uh, non-Muslims that is, have misunderstandings concerning Islam. Muslims themselves have misunderstandings concerning Islam. Okay, Muslims themselves are confused about many things in Islam. So what about non-Muslim? Even more so, okay? So it's not surprising that when a, a family member, they embrace Islam, there's a sense of shock, maybe a sense of uh, trepidation. There's a sense of uh, fear. Many feelings that people have that, oh, my sister, my daughter has embraced Islam. Is she going to become one of those people that we see on the TV where, you know, uh, certain members of the uh, maybe Muslim community have maybe you know, done something wrong and they sensationalize their behavior, automatically go to, you know, worst case scenario. It's why it's important for us, say us, you know, because I embrace Islam, that those who embrace Islam, that you have a big responsibility on your shoulders, okay, to show and teach your family members the true Islam, okay, and the right picture of Al-Islam, starting with your parents. And then, inshallah ta'ala, it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the other members of your family, uh, their hearts towards their understanding of Islam. Because, you know, you becoming a Muslim doesn't mean that you treat anybody in a disrespectful manner. Uh, in fact, as a Muslim, we are required to respect you even more, okay? And to treat you even better. And to uphold a very, very high level of character, especially with our blood relations. If somebody is going to cut you off because you, just because you are a Muslim, it shows how deep, unfortunately, their misunderstanding of Islam is that they see it for however they see it to the extent that I'm going to cut the relationship I have with my own sister. If you had a previously a good relationship with her and because you became a Muslim, that she wants to disown you if you like, just because you became Muslim, it means that she has a very, very misrepresented understanding of Al-Islam. So therefore, you know, you do what you can, maybe through your parents indirectly. Because you have to be wise, you have to be fair and be real. If I start contacting my sister constantly, it may bother her even more and she may become even more staunch. So you need to think about different ways that you can break down the ignorance, quite simply. Okay, we shouldn't be judging people like this. You know, if we're adults and we're of, of sound mind, you know, why should we be judging people like this? Even though that I'm a Muslim now, you have a completely different lifestyle. Okay, do I, dif do I disrespect you? Do I say anything bad about the life, you know, the life choices that you make? No, it's your life. But nonetheless, we are blood relations. We are brother. Uh, we are sisters. We grew up together with the same parents. You know, there should be some common ground with one another. Just because I'm a Muslim, it doesn't mean that uh, I, you know, I'm disrespecting you. Okay, you have to respect everyone. You have to respect respect everybody in the choices that they that they make. So start with your parents, okay, inshallah ta'ala. Make lots of dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala softens their hearts. And no matter what, no matter what, 
you know, uh, you can spend years and years and years and years calling, you know, your closest members of your family. And, you know, sometimes you, f you feel that those people, they will never embrace Islam. I can never see it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yahdi man yasha. Allah jalla wa ala guides whom he wills. So, you know, never give up that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change their hearts, even if it's a little, little bit. They will see that in your behavior. And people who are maybe disrespecting you and saying bad things or behaving in an appropriate way, we don't follow that way. Those who behave like that, like this are not our teachers. Okay? We follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ in addressing and speaking with people in the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them. Because Al-Islam is the most beautiful gift that can be given to any one person. Many of them don't realize that. So try to be patient with them, make lots of dua. And even though that they may be like this, maybe one day, inshallah ta'ala, you can... Uh, you know, rekindle the relationship you had with your, your sibling. At least it's to be, you know, uh, on a respectful manner, you know, a, a decent manner when you're dealing with, with one another. And Allah Azza knows best. Okay, we have some more questions, inshallah ta'ala. Um, what are the things that invalidate and break wudu? So the wudu is that ablution that you make before ibadah, before salah. That's a requirement, it's a condition of prayer that you're in a state of tahara. Um, however, there are certain things which will nullify, break the wudu, which requires you to go and perform it again, so you're ready for salah, for example. So answering the call of nature, okay, uh, passing wind, touching the private part, okay, these are all things uh, which nullify your wudu. A common question is, oh, I touched something which is impure. Does that break my wudu? Uh, you know, maybe a, a dog brushed past me. Do I need to make wudu? Touching an impurity, okay, it's a very important point. Touching an impurity doesn't nullify your wudu. If I have wudu and I touch something which is impure, I still have wudu, but I am required to wash away that impurity. Okay? I'm required to wash away the impurity if it is apparent that there is an impurity. Okay? Otherwise, I'm still in a, a state of wudu. Okay? This is a very important uh, point, and uh, I'm asked this question many, many times. Um, yeah, so touching an impurity does not nullify your wudu. But you are required to clean it if there is an apparent impurity which is there. No, and Allah Jalla wa'ala knows best. Will you explain the hadith, it is enough of a lie for a man to narrate everything he hears? Kafa bil mar'i kadiban an yuhadithu kullu ma sami'a. So the Prophet ﷺ, hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet ﷺ says, yes, it is enough that uh, enough uh, for a man to be considered a liar, or even a woman for that matter, that they narrate everything that they hear. And what does this mean? So as Muslims, we are required, it's very important, that everything that we may hear, everything that we may hear may not be truthful, may not be sound, may not be authentic. So imagine now, uh, this person, all the information that they passes by, they're just passing it along, okay? Whether it's truthful or not truthful, sound, not sound, authentic, da'if, doesn't matter. It'd be sufficient to call that, that person a liar. Why? Because they're passing on false information, okay? So the Muslim has to be very, very careful about information that they may hear, that they may come across. Is this authentic? Is this true? Is it even your business? And there's a number of things, a number of filters that we should have as Muslims before uh, we're going to pass on information. Number one, is it your business? Min husni min husni min husni al Islam al Mar. Tarku ma la yani. That from the good things of a Muslim is to stay away from things, not engage in things that are not your business. Okay, so and so is doing this now. Did you know so and so has this? Did you know so and so is doing this? It's not your business. Okay, okay, it's not your business. Amsik alayka hada. Hold your tongue. Okay, it's not your business. Secondly, the information that comes to you. Um, is it truthful or not? Is it even sound? Haqiq. You know, make sure that, that what you are saying or passing on is actually the truth and it is sound. If even in the first place it is your business for you to be passing on in the, third, in, in the first place. Okay? So this is a very, uh, it's a very good question. 
and it's a very important hadith for us to understand, inshallah ta'ala. Is it permissible to listen or recite the Qur'an without hijab? Okay, there is nothing specific uh, from the sunnah to say that a woman has to wear hijab <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if she's listening or wearing the hijab at home, for example. If she wants to recite the Qur'an and she's not wearing hijab, ma fi bats. No problem, inshallah ta'ala. No problem. It's permitted for her to recite the Qur'an. Uh, what is the du'a after the, uh, after the adhan? Alhamdulillah, uh, here on the channel, the adhan is placed at the beginning time and you hear the du'a, Allahumma rabba hadhi da'wat al-tama wa salatu al-qa'ima ati muhammadin wa sirati wa fadila wa ba'atu maqama mahmudin aladhi wa'ata. This is the du'a that you make uh, after, uh, after the, uh, the adhan and uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he said, whoever says that halat lahu uh, shafa'ati yawm al-qiyamah that I will be able to, inshallah ta'ala, intercede for that individual on the Day of Judgment. Okay, so it's a very important dua for us to make after the Adhan. Uh, what are the qualities of those who enter Al-Firdaus? Okay, I'll give you one reference for you to go to, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, in Surah Al-Mu'minun. Okay, Surah Al-Mu'minun, Qada Aflah Al-Mu'minun. I want you to read the first 11 verses of this particular chapter. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسَ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ That this is the, uh, they are the one who inherits. And what do they inherit? Inheritors rather. And what do they inherit? They inherit the, the firdaus, the paradise. Okay? So go to Surah Al-Mu'minun and read the first uh, 11 verses or so where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, the establishment and preservation of the Salah Those who stay away from foul, bad language or Those who are giving charity and paying their zakah And those who are with their trusts uh, Those with their trusts and their promises That they fulfill them Okay, So these are the important characteristics for us to fulfill and to have So that we can be from the people of Jannah inshallah ta'ala and there are other verses in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the characteristics of those who are successful and those who are righteous. Okay, and these, of course, as we know, the righteous and the successful ones, they will be from the people of paradise uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Okay, but with special reference to Surah Al-Mu'minun, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is best. Uh, can I read a translation of the Qur'an if I cannot read Arabic? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're at a stage where you cannot read the Arabic, and I would encourage you to do whatever is necessary to start reading the Qur'an, find a teacher, find the means to, whether it's online, uh, there are many, mashallah, ways uh, to learn Arabic, to read, to read Arabic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this Qur'an easy to read, inshallah ta'ala, okay? If you have desire to read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for you, inshallah ta'ala. If in the meantime you want to read some of the translation of the meanings in the language that you can understand, come on, Labats, it's absolutely no problem. Whether it's in, uh, you know, of course, it would be in your native language, whether it's English or, or French or Italian or whatever language you speak, Alhamdulillah, I'm sure that there are a translation of the meanings uh, of the Quran so that you can understand some of the things uh, or many of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to in the Quran. And Allah Jalla wa'ala knows best. Uh, what is the difference between a prophet and a messenger, a nabi and a rasul? If at all there is any difference. Okay. So, when Allah subhanahu when we say, for example, uh, Nabi Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Rasul Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is there a difference between us saying a prophet and a messenger? Well, at times, uh, it may, if, you say, if we say the prophet, it may include them as a messenger as well, to state that, yes, there is a difference. Okay, there is a difference. So at times, if we say that he's the prophet, it doesn't mean he's not the messenger. Or if we say he's the messenger, alayhi salam, that he's not a prophet. Okay? So there are certain individuals that Allah Taala chose as both prophets and messengers. And then there are others who are just prophets. 
Okay? Now, is there a difference between the two? Well, some of the ulama have pointed out some differences between the two. Okay? So some potential differences are, for example, that a messenger will receive new revelation okay, from the previous prophet. The prophet before was there to confirm the same message that may came before him. Okay? The prophet is there to confirm uh, the same message that came before. Okay. Um, another potential difference is, so that clear, inshallah ta'ala, a messenger receives new revelation, whereas a prophet is there to confirm the previous message. Another potential difference is that, uh, that the people of a messenger will reject him. They reject a messenger, uh, so the messenger is sent to a disbelieving people or a rebellious people, whereas a prophet is sent to confirm and sent to a believing people, okay? So that's also uh, another potential difference. So there is a difference between the two, inshallah ta'ala, and these are some of the differences uh, between the two, and Allah Jalla wa'ala knows best. What we can say is that every messenger is also a prophet, but not every prophet is a messenger, and Allah knows best. Okay. What should I do if my family engage in haram during the day of Eid? So, we're about five days out from Eid, alhamdulillah. What I would say is that start speaking with your family now about the sum of things that you can do, inshallah ta'ala, which are within the realms of halal and not haram. Okay? So the fact that people recognize Eid that this is an Islamic celebration. This occurs on the 10th day of Dhul Hijjah, which is Yawm Al Hajj Al Akbar, the greatest day in the Hajj, the day of sacrifice, Yawm Al Nahar. If they recognize this, then why would one engage in such disobedience to Allah Taala on such a blessed day? If somebody wants to get involved in Haram, choose your own, choose an occasion when it is not so sacred. Do your haram at another time for, for, the, for the sake of your own selves, you know, for your own self-respect. Of course, maybe I'm saying it quite harshly. I don't mean to come across like this, and I don't, uh, I'm talking about in principle. This is what's to be in your mind. So maybe say on the day of Eid, let's go to the, the masjid, or let's go outside and offer Salat al-Eid. Okay, let's go there and start the day off the way that the Prophet ﷺ told us to do that, and attend Salat al-Eid. Exchanged gifts, mashaAllah. Visit family members, that's fine. Now, obviously, not mentioned here. My family is engaging in haram. I don't know what's being engaged in exactly. But try your best to uh, advise them in the very best way and give them substitutes. It's haram, 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 haram. And they say, well, you're just haram police. What are we supposed to do? We want to enjoy ourselves. Okay, so give them something else. Okay, give them substitutes. Give them something else that they can do, inshallah ta'ala. No. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all, make it easy for us. Ameen. If I want to attend the mosque every day for one salah in congregation, can my wife stop me? Why does your wife want to stop you to go from going to the masjid, yaqi? That's the question in the first place. Why does your wife want to stop you if you just want to go once a day? No. I think maybe that's a, a good question to ask in the first place as opposed to me just saying, no, she can't stop you, and then you go, and then you start arguing, okay? And then... Uh, she says, well, why are you doing this? You're not listening to me. Well, I'll just, you know, I listen to the program. Imam Saab says, just go. And is, that's not a solution for you, maybe, okay? So maybe it's a good question to ask her, why don't you want me to go to the masjid once a day? Why? Okay, try to understand her and try to rectify this uh, particular understanding. And then you can get to the bottom of it. And once you resolve that, maybe uh, you can maybe go five times a day, inshallah ta'ala. No. Um... What can I do if my husband does not spend any time with me? Uh, it's very difficult to answer this question, sister, uh, on two levels. Number one, I've got about 30 seconds left. Secondly, uh, something like that, even if we had five minutes, it's difficult to kind of get to the bottom of it. What I would say is that it's important for the husband and wife to spend time with each other, inshallah ta'ala, to respect each other's rights, to be fair with one another, 
And if one of the uh, sides of their spouses, the husband and wife, feel that things aren't really going in a good way, to sit down, communicate and speak. Okay, don't keep quiet and let it build up. Speak and communicate. Tell them what you like and how to resolve it, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala join your hearts. Okay, brothers and sisters, we've come to the end of this particular show. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all during these days. Ameen. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم فإن تنازعتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله والرسول إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر